Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multidimensional RPG podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 285 of Game Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. On this show, we discuss the craft and the art of game mastering. I've been running RPGs for over 29 years now, and I produce this show in the hopes that you can benefit from my experience, my triumphs, and most of all, (laughs) my mistakes. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, Again, this is episode 285. This is the second episode of season 15. And today we are continuing our world building discussion that we started in episode 284. And this is based on questions and suggestions from you in our Discord channel as to things world building related you'd like to hear about. So again, thank you to everyone who participated in this episode by asking questions or or giving ideas for topics. Super, super helpful. Uh, Last episode was pretty much entirely uh, in response to some questions and statements made by Lucid Guppy in the Discord. And we're going to hear some more from Lucid Guppy today and as as well as some other listener GMs. So the topics that we are going to cover today is first we're going to talk about how to create a world that your players are invested in. Or maybe a better way to say that is how to get your players invested in the world you've created or are creating. After that, we're going to talk about using player ideas and backstories in the adventures that you create. Um, Some thoughts on how to do that. And finally, we're going to talk about using different cultures in the real world as inspiration for cultures in your world to uh, add to the variety and diversity of, of what you have going on in your world and to also get away from what's been done so many times before to try to do something different, something new. And as part of that, I am going to give you a list of books that might be helpful to you that are anthropological books about different cultures that um, it's real world knowledge, but uh, I think it can be a great inspiration for coming up with cultures for your game, especially if you want to go outside of the kind of quote standard uh, European and American cultures that, that we're probably everyone listening to this is really familiar with, but, but going into things a little more different and um, unusual from, from our point of view, completely usual from the point of view of people that live in that culture, of course. So yeah, that's what we're going to talk about today. And it's a lot to cover and, and we're kind of just continuing where we left off last time. So we are just going to jump into it. All right, so our next topic on our world building <laughs> extravaganza is uh, again coming from from Lucid Guppy's uh, question he asked in the Discord. So the first uh, part of his question had to do with small scale world building, as far as you know, how do I focus on the small scale, uh, which we just addressed uh, in the last segment. But the other part of his question, I felt like was how do I create a world that the players are invested in? How do I get the players invested and interested in this world I've created? So let's talk about that. So my experience over the years as a GM, and this is just my experience, my opinion, I don't want to offend anyone. This is just what I think, (laughs) is that many players are, for lack of a better word, lazy. And I'll include myself in that. When I am a player in a game, I am much more, quote, lazy than I am when I'm the the GM. 
And by lazy, I mean that most players, in my experience, will come to your game and will, for the most part, when they're at the table at your game, uh, be, you know, focused on the game and have their heads in the game and, and things like that. But once that game session is over, they're done. And they're done until the next session starts. So, you know, if you're a GM who's expecting your players to do a lot of stuff in between sessions, like develop their characters or backstories or uh, help you world build stuff or whatever, a lot of times you're going to be disappointed. A lot of players aren't going to do that kind of thing. Um, Even getting players to interact in between game sessions on a forum or in a chat room or something like that. A lot of players, you just won't hear from them but between games. They, you know, once your game session is over, it's out of their mind until the next session. They don't think about it. Um, or if they do, it's just kind of a passing thing. They're not going to sit down with a paper and pencil and and do anything about it. Um, now, not all players. There are definitely exceptions. And, and those are the players that are truly joys to run for, the ones that really get invested and will spend time outside of the game, thinking about the game, thinking about their characters, um, coming up with what their character is going to do next or coming up with members of their character's family or, or whatever. And I've definitely had players like that that will just go all out. And that is awesome. You get a player like that, do everything you can to hold on to them because they're they're a keeper. But it's not realistic to expect that. My experience through the years have been that the vast majority of players at best, they will show up to the game on time, be there for most, if not all, sessions. And that's about it. That, that's, a, that's the most you can expect from most players. So if you're a new GM, just you just got to accept that. It's just the way it is. Now, you can try to curate players that will go above and beyond. And, and you may have success with that. But um, you, you will have to turn a lot of people away. Because most of the players you encounter are, are not going to be that way they're they're just going to show up and play the game and then then they're done and you know that's that's fine i'm not criticizing that i'm just saying that is the reality and and you should accept the reality and not live in this fantasy where you think players are going to be you know spending hours and hours outside of the game thinking about your world and thinking about the game and their characters because at least with adult players that has not been my experience now when i was younger when i was in uh, especially high school and even to some degree college, it did seem like more players would do more of that between sessions. Pro- it probably, it's probably just a, a large part of it's just the amount of free time people have and the amount of responsibilities they have. But yeah, when you're talking adults, it, it's very rare um, that you see that. And and when you do see it, it's usually in bursts. It's not a continuous thing. It's like something will happen that really inspires a player or motivates them and you'll get this burst of creativity from them. Um, but, but it will, you know, it won't be forever kind of thing. So that's been my experience. And and that's just something we, we have to accept. That's just the reality that, that we need to work with. So I think that the key is to focus on player engagement when they're at the table. That's really your best chance to uh, get more from your players if that's what you want. Focus on their engagement. Focus on hooking them into the story, hooking them into the adventure, hooking them into the game. Once you get a player engaged and hooked on the story, once you get them wanting to find out what happens next, then they might do a little more. They might do something like develop their character more if you ask them to or come up with, with a backstory or whatever. But trying to get a player to do that, a player that doesn't already just do it on their own, without them having that level of attachment to the game and engagement, in my experience, is is seldom successful. And even if you get them to do it, it'll be kind of half-hearted, which isn't probably what you want. So I think the first instinct that a lot of GMs have is to just hand the players a stack of papers (laughs) filled with information on their setting. I think this is exactly the worst possible thing you could do. This is the worst approach to take. First, a lot of players are not going to read any of that or, or most of it, or if they do read it, they're not going to retain much of it. They they won't remember much of it later. Um, Second, 
it's just a terrible way to present your world. It, it's the worst possible way to present information on your world to the players is to give them a bunch of crap to read. Ultimately, you want your players to be as excited about your world as you are. I mean, that's the goal that we're striving for. May never get there, but but that's what we're shooting for. You want them to be as in love with the world as you are. So giving them homework to read is not the best way to accomplish that. As I so often say, I think the best thing to do if you want to be a better GM is a look at what good writers do. And, and I recently had someone asking me this in, in the Discord or something, uh, what I would recommend, what RPG books I would recommend to help people world build or be a better GM. And my answer was, I wouldn't recommend RPG books at all. If you want to learn to be a better world builder, uh, go listen to writers talk about world building. There are a lot of, I'm sure there are a lot of writing podcasts out there I've uh, listened to the podcast Writing Excuses for years. Uh, Brandon Sanderson does that podcast with with some other writers. Um, it's changed over the years. Who's all involved with that? But they've been doing that for years and it's free. <laughs> Go to writingexcuses.com and uh, they've done tons of stuff on world building. That's where you go. Listen to the pros talk about world building. Most of what Writers talk about, especially genre writers, fantasy writers, sci-fi writers, when they talk about writing as a craft, a lot of that, if not most of it, if not all of it, you can apply as a GM. If, if you think about what you're doing, you don't want to railroad players or anything like that. But when it comes to making an engaging story, making engaging characters, making an engaging world, that's all the same, whether you're a writer or a game master, it's, it's all the same. So... I think the analogy I made when I was talking to someone about this was, you know, if you wanted to learn in any skill, if you wanted to learn psychology, would you rather learn psychology from a high school graduate who took a class on psychology in high school? Or would you rather learn psychology from someone who has a PhD in psychology, right? You'd learn from the PhD, right? So the same thing with this, you know, if you want to learn world building, I mean, yeah, you can read what the folks at Wizards have to say about it in the DMG. You know, you want to you want to learn from a master, not not a journeyman, <laughs> right? And and frankly, the masters are the really successful fantasy and sci-fi writers out there because they're the ones doing it. They're the ones building worlds that people are paying a lot of money to read about. That's where the good writers are. The good writers aren't or the best writers, I should say, aren't writing for wizards. They're writing for themselves, right? And it's the kind of the same thing with like these um, established IPs. You know, like, like for instance, if you go read Star Trek novels or Star Wars novels, you know, those tend to not be the best writers out there. Now, some really good writers do write for those IPs for whatever reason, but a lot of writers start out writing for them to get started. But... A writer who's really good, that knows what they're doing, they're going to write for themselves because that's frankly where the money is. And that's, you know, if you're writing for Star Trek or, or Star Wars, there are a lot of rules you have to follow. You don't have a lot of say in things about the setting and things like that because you have to, to stay within the lines. But when you're writing your own IP for yourself or for your publisher, you can do whatever you want. You know, if you're writing for Wizards, for D&D, they're... There are a lot of limitations. There are things that they just can't do because it's D and D and it won't fit D and D. So, I mean, think about it. If you were a super talented writer who's really good at what you do, what, how would you want to spend your time? Would you write for yourself and, and write for a publisher like Tor or something? Or would you, you know, write for Star Wars or would you write for Wizards of the Coast? So I think that the answer is obvious. So, so again, you know, you want to get your information from the best possible source. And, and I'd say for this kind of stuff, uh, for world building, epic fantasy writers are where it's at. Now, if you're concerned more about sci-fi, then I would look at sci-fi writers. But just my experience as a reader has been that it's a lot easier to find really good writers in fantasy than it is in science fiction. Um, unfortunately, a lot of writers in science fiction aren't actually that great of writers. And I'm not sure why that is. Um, but fantasy, on the other hand, there are some phenomenal 
writers in fantasy. Brandon Sanderson is a great example. He's a fantastic world builder. I can't honestly think of a better person to learn from other than Robert Jordan, who is no longer with us, unfortunately, when it when it comes to world building. So if, if you want to figure out how to engage your players in, in your game, how to get them interested in your story, uh, look at what, what good writers do. How do they get the reader interested in the story? How do they get them hooked into that book? Take, take a fantasy book or, or another book that you really like, that you love, and read it again and read it with the eye of a GM trying to learn, trying to figure out what is this writer doing? What, what is it about this book that is working for me? What is it about it that's making me excited and making me want to keep turning the pages and keep reading and then apply that to your, to your game? So specifically, look at how the writer, since we're talking about world building and, and getting players engaged in your setting, look at how the writer introduces the reader to the world and how they explain the world to them. You know, likely if it's a good book we're talking about here, and it likely is because we said pick your favorite book, the writer is not going to dump paragraphs and paragraphs of exposition about the world on you, especially modern books. Now you read Tolkien, you're going to find that. But you read modern books written in the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years, you're not going to see that. In any successful book, you're not going to see paragraphs and paragraphs of just describing the world because it's, it's not a good way to do it. It's not engaging. It's bad writing, frankly. So there's a writer's adage that you've probably heard, show, don't tell. So we can use this technique as GMs too. Look for every opportunity to show your players your world in action. Show them how it works as opposed to just telling them about it. So giving them a handful of papers to read, that's the epitome of telling. That's nothing but telling. And it's boring. And it's not engaging. For instance, you could give the players a write-up on how the economy works in your world, how merchants don't actually have set prices for goods. Instead, they haggle, and most transactions involving common folk are trades of goods and don't involve coins at all. Only rich merchants and nobles trading amongst themselves use coins. So you could explain all that. But me just explaining that to you right now, you're probably bored already, right? Imagine having to read 10 pages about it. So yeah, it'd be pretty dry and boring. So if you did that, maybe if you're lucky, one of your players would read it. But this is pretty telling, right? If you hand this thing to six players and only one of them reads it, that tells you something. So what you could do instead is wait and don't tell them any of that. Wait until it becomes relevant to the story and then show the players how this works in action. So in this example, where we're talking about how the economy works and how merchants barter and and don't use coins usually, um, wait until a player wants to buy supplies for an expedition or wants to buy arrows or buy a new weapon or something like that. Then you can have a role-playing scene with this merchant that you've fleshed out, like we talked about before, where the player character is expected to haggle over the, quote, price of the item that they want. And the merchant expects the player to offer some form of commodity or trade good for this item instead of, you know, handing them a pile of gold coins or whatever. So maybe the merchant is visibly surprised when the player character wants to pay with coins because judging by the PC's clothes, the merchant assumes they're of the peasant class and peasants don't normally have coins to spend. So with some finesse, you can get the same ideas across that you would have tried to get across with the, with the handout, but you do so in a much more engaging, interesting, and entertaining way. Not only will all the players who are there for that session get the information, but they're much more likely to remember it and, and to refer to it and use it in the future because they were engaged when they were exposed to that information. And, and there's been, you know, psychological studies to show that a big part of our retention of information we're exposed to is how much we're engaged and active in the process of taking in that information. So when it's very passive and you're just sitting there staring at the thing, you're, you're much less likely to remember it than if you're more active and engaged in interacting with it. Um, this is why, you know, like multimedia and stuff works so well, 
is because it tends to be more engaging than just reading words on a page. It's also a lot more fun for everyone involved doing it this way, right? Than, than saying, hey, read this, read this chapter <laughs> by next week. Sounds like a class. You want to try to not overload players with details that don't matter in the current scene. Again, this is a lesson taken directly from reading good novels. Emulate good genre writers who give vivid descriptions that add to what's going on in the moment without distracting you from it. So they're not giving you a bunch of crap that isn't relevant or doesn't matter. They're only giving you things that add to the flavor and vibrancy of the scene that you're being exposed to right now. And everything they give you is directly relevant to what's happening right now. Try to make the details you provide concise, but rich in character and depth. Stephen King recommends, I, I think, two or three unique things when, when you describe a person or a place or anything. Just describe two or three unique things about that thing. And that's it. And that will be enough to cement an image in the reader's mind and for them to remember what that thing is. Um, this comes from his book on writing, which if you can get the audible, I think it's audible, but the audio version of the book, which he reads himself, I highly, highly recommend it. In, in fact, um, I should add that to the show notes because if you want to learn about world building or to be a better GM, listen to on writing or read it if you can't get the audio version and you will learn a lot because Stephen King is a master at the craft. He knows what he's talking about. So yeah, you don't need a wall of description. Two or three interesting, unique things. That's it. So make the details you provide concise, make them relevant to what's happening right now. So kind of a uh, metaphor, in, instead of describing the entire iceberg, we want to give a very compelling and short concise, short description of the tip of the iceberg while giving an impression of the rest of the iceberg that's there. And the player will just have to investigate further, engage to learn the rest or to learn more about what's below the surface that you didn't just tell them. Again, they're going to do this because you've piqued their curiosity, right? You start droning on with paragraphs of description, they're just going to tune you out whether they mean to or not. But you just give them a two or three really interesting details, they they might go digging for more. And I would say that that's the key. You have got to pique the player's interest and curiosity first. Once you've done that, then you can give them more information. So make them ask for it, so to speak. Make them want it and then give it to them. Don't give it to them before they don't want it because it won't stick with them. Once the interest is there, they're, they'll eat it up. But before that interest is there, most of what you try to tell them will go in one ear and right out the other ear. Also, a detail of the world that you are going to give the players uh, should matter. It should be important to the current scene, to what's happening right now, or to the character involved. If it isn't, if it's not relevant, if it's not important, then describing it at this time is only going to distract and detract from what you're trying to accomplish with that scene. And why, why would you want to do that? You're shooting yourself in the foot. Now, if you really want to get advanced here, think about how great authors characterize their characters through their point of view descriptions through that character's eyes. One of the true masters of this is Robert Jordan. So scenes in Robert Jordan's books are described very differently depending on whose point of view we're experiencing that scene from. So, so Robert Jordan uses the point of view called third person limited, which you may not know the term, but I think when I describe it, you'll know what I'm talking about. So, th so this is a story where it's written in third person, but it's written from the point of view of a specific character. So a, a first person story would be something like, I walked down the street looking for my dog. I couldn't find my dog anywhere. That's first person. I'm using I, right? I, me, we, that kind of thing. That's first person. So third person would be John walked down the street. He couldn't find his dog anywhere, right? So that's third person. And it's from John's point of view. So that's what the, the limited of third person limited means, which means 
if the writer is doing third person limited and we're in John's head during this scene, then, you know, the writer shouldn't be telling us what anyone else around John is thinking. All we know is what John is thinking and what John sees, what John hears. So, so we might get some clues into what other characters are thinking because John might observe their body language or their expression, you know, um, John saw Mary frown and what appeared to be worry, you know, something like that. But John doesn't really know what Mary's thinking. Now there, there's another point of view called omniscient where the writer will jump around from head to head and you'll know what all kinds of people are thinking, but, um, that's less common these days, but the, the books of the wheel of time written by Robert Jordan are in third person limited. So at any point in the story, you are experiencing the story through the through the eyes of a specific character, through their point of view. So what he does is he will describe things differently based on who the character is that's the point of view character because different characters will see the same thing in different ways because they're different people. So the point of view character is just whose, whose eyes are, are we seeing the scene through whose head are we in for this scene so there's a great scene in, in one of the wheel of time books where the characters come upon an abandoned village and you know the, the village is obviously abandoned everybody's fled and the characters are trying to figure out how long has it been since everybody left the village how long has the village been empty two of the characters come to this same conclusion that the people left fairly recently. But they arrive at that conclusion in two very different ways. One of the characters, Nynaeve, notices that there are spring curtains in the windows. It's early spring at the time. She observes that if the villagers had left very long ago, the windows would still have winter, winter curtains, not spring curtains. She says no good woman would have hung those spring curtains more than a week or so ago. So based on that, she says they they left at most a week or so ago. Perrin, on the other hand, one of the other characters, who's a blacksmith's apprentice, notices some tools lying about on the village green. He notices that the edges of the tools are still shiny. They haven't rusted yet, which tells him that they haven't been lying out in the open for that long. So both of these characters are coming to the same conclusion that the people didn't live that long ago but they're noticing very different things in the scene based on their personality and their experience. Nynaeve notices the curtains because she has experience with that. And she knows that, you know, no, no woman would, would have those curtains up in the winter for whatever reason. I, personally, I'm not sure what the difference is between winter and spring curtains. Maybe the winter ones are thicker or maybe it's a color or design thing. I, I don't know. I don't know. But, but Nynaeve knew, and that's the important thing. Perrin, on the other hand, notices the tools and the lack of rust. And that, that's just one example of, of how this is done. But, but hopefully that shows you how you could have the same scene, but describe it very differently based on who is describing that scene and what kind of things would that person notice. Now, Robert Jordan does this very consistently through, through the books, and he's, he's excellent at it. So, you know, you want to learn how to do this, read The Wheel of Time, uh, you'll be in good hands. Descriptions are always, always in those books, colored by the person doing the observing. Perrin, the blacksmith's apprentice, will often notice things about people's weapons, their armor, tools that they're using, how well they're crafted, how well they're taken care of, things like that, because he's a blacksmith. So he notices things that have to do with being a blacksmith. Matt, another character, whose father was a horse trader, notices things about people's horses that others miss, like how good of a horse is. Is this a, a horse that would be really fast or a horse that would have really good endurance? Is this a horse that is well-trained or not? Is this a horse that's been well cared for or not? He notices those kinds of things that others don't because his dad was a horse trader and he learned a lot about horses growing up. Elaine, who is a daughter heir to the throne of the nation of Andor, kind of like a princess, basically, notices very different things than Egwene, who grew up as an innkeeper's daughter in a small village. So if you really want to get advanced as a DM, you can use this approach when you describe things to your players. 
Think about that player's character and what they might specifically notice about the scene or the character that you're describing that others might not notice and focus on those things. You can pull on the character's class and their background for this. So a fighter will notice different things than a wizard will. You know, the the fighter like Perrin might notice the weapons and armor that people are using and how well cared for they are. He might, when going into a new village or town, might notice the defenses and, and how well defended is it? How high and thick are the walls? How many men are atop the walls? How many people are patrolling in the streets? Things like that. Those are all things that a fighter would notice. The wizard, on the other hand, probably wouldn't notice those kinds of things, but might notice if there are any signs of magic or the use of magic about, might notice any rare herbs along the path they're traveling that, that might be useful to a wizard, things like that. I, I, think, you, I think you see the point. Again, you, in, you could use their class or you could use their, their background. So a character with the sailor background is going to notice different things than the character with the soldier background. So, you know, a sailor background character if they're in the harbor district, you know, might notice things, very specific things about the ships in port that the other characters w- wouldn't know anything about, things like that. So think about the the character or the characters and describe things that that those specific characters would notice. And you could describe one thing for each player. So maybe you have a player character who is a fighter and you have a player character who's a wizard and you have a player character who's, I don't know, a druid. So you're describing this scene in this village and maybe you say, oh, John the fighter notices that everyone in this village seems really well armed. Like, you know, it's, it's unusual to see everyone in a village wearing a sword. The, the wizard Bob notices sense of incense in the village, which suggests someone in the village might, might be using some kind of divination magic. And maybe the, the rogue Jill notices <laughs> that people's uh, valuables are are secured, like their coin pouches are tied very securely to uh, their belts or whatever, suggesting that maybe there's a lot of thievery going on in, in this town. That kind of thing. So, you know, these are things that, that it's helpful to think about ahead of time. You know, if you know your players are going to a new location or are going to meet a new NPC, maybe ask yourself, well, what's something each of the characters might notice about this person or this place that, that I can give them. And, and it's really going to add to the immersion uh, for your players. Now, if you know your players well, then another technique that can work is to pull in some of the interests of the players to your descriptions and, and what you decide to focus on. So if you have a player who's a foodie, they're, they're really in the food. Like I assume Matt Mercer is from his Wildemount book and how he gives uh, the dishes for for every place, which is awesome. Um, if you have a player that's really into food, you might hook that player in more to what's going on by describing when they go to a new inn, describing what they're serving, um, describing some of the dishes and some of the smells coming out of the kitchen uh, or some of the things the player sees on the plates of, of other people eating at the inn. And through that description, you can show the kinds of foods that are produced in the area, um, and possibly even exported, you know, crops that they grow, animals they raise, things like that, which normally would be a very dry piece of information to give, like, here are the exports of this town that the players wouldn't care about. But if you present it as, oh, you know, it seems like people here prepare a lot of um, fish and, and, and they're using some exotic spice you've never smelled before and you really anxious to taste it, what it tastes like, you know, that's a lot more evocative and and interesting, especially, like I said, if you have a player that's really into food or I've had players that are really into beer and I myself am into beer. And that's another thing is, is also focus on what you're into, focus on your strengths, things that you know about. So I know about beer. I know I've brewed my own beer. I know how beer is made. I know different types of beer. I, I know what kind of climates you'll find beer in versus wine. And at least how in Historically on Earth, uh, there were certain regions where wine could be grown It was certain latitudes, I believe, based on the climate. And so those regions, they produced wine because they could grow grapes that, that made good wine. 
Um, and in other regions that where they couldn't do that, they made beer instead. So knowing things like that, I can give more vivid descriptions when players go to an inn as far as, oh, you know, you notice all the beers here are really dark, you know, and very, they're very stout beers or, oh, you know, in this town, all the, all the beers are really high in alcohol content for some reason or, or whatever. So again, just by really focusing on, on a few, a small number of vivid details, you can really bring things alive without bogging people down with way too much information. All right. So our next topic comes to us from Kai Guar, Kiguar. <laughs> I should have asked him how to pronounce this on Discord. And this is going to be about using player ideas and backstories in your adventures. So Kai Guar says, I have two players who have zero problems fleshing out things they like. For instance, one player created a local thieves guild for the world. But then how do I turn those player contributed ideas into fronts slash dangers slash plot hooks? So basically, how do I use these things that the players create in the story? So yeah, that's a that's a great question and a great topic to to tackle today. So personally, when I'm trying to do something like this, I tend to look for intersections between my ideas, the ideas I, I already have for the world or the adventure or whatever it is, and then the player ideas, the ideas that the players are bringing. So when the players throw out ideas, whether they're NPCs they create as part of their backstory or an organization like a Thieves Guild, like Kaiguar is talking about here, any kind of idea like that that a player comes up with in a game, I tend to ask myself, you know, how could I use this idea in what I'm already planning? So, you know, you don't even necessarily have to take a left turn in your campaign or or come up with something entirely new based on, on what a player has done. I mean, you completely can, of course, but you don't always have to. Sometimes you can find ways to fit in what the players are doing in the things you've already planned. And at least in my experience, when you can do this, it always makes it better. It always ends up better than what you originally planned. And honestly, I just think that's because of the whole, you know, two heads are better than one thing. So especially when you're talking about creative things, to some degree, the, the more people you can have involved generating ideas and things, the better it's going to be because, you know, there, there's we each have our own points of view and biases as creators and just as people. So when you have one person creating something, you're kind of just seeing one point of view. So the more points of view you can get, usually the, the better product or, or end result you you get. Now, now, of course, there's there's a thing of diminishing returns there. Um, once a collaboration involves too many people, it, it starts to undermine itself because it, it can be difficult to coordinate a lot of people together. But just as a general rule, more brains working on the problem is usually a good thing. So if we're talking here about maybe like a like a character's backstory, a player character's backstory, you know, a lot of times these can have nuggets in them, ideas or or things that the players come up with as part of this backstory that would be really good hooks in the game in, in what you're already planning. Some things players will often have in their backstory that, that can be like this, that can be good hooks to use, uh, are things like missing family members. So this is pretty common to see in a player character's backstory that they have some kind of family member who disappeared, you know, went missing at some point in their past. It, it might be a parent or a sibling that disappeared, maybe a, a father who left to buy cigarettes and never came back, or a sister who was abducted by raiders, or a brother who disappeared into the woods and, and was never seen again and is assumed to have died. So you'll find these kinds of things in player character backstories a lot. So you could always, as the GM, come up with what actually happened to that person that's missing and then find a way to connect that into the story that you want to tell. 
So maybe, you know, the father that, that disappeared, that went out to buy smokes and never came back, uh, maybe they run into him in a city that they visit during the adventure. And, oh, wow, here's this character's long lost father, um, long lost deadbeat father. <laughs> Uh, maybe they end up fighting the very group of bandits that abducted the sister years ago. And they learn that she escaped from these bandits and might still be alive out there somewhere. Maybe when traveling the wilderness, the player characters meet a druid who knows about the brother who disappeared and knows that he was taken in by a nearby tribe of wood elves. So, of course... You can take one of these hooks, something that interests you or that, that you think would be fun to play with, and you can just come up with an adventure based on that or or come up with a scene or a scenario based on that. But you can also often find ways to use that in things that you're already planning, which, which is always what I would recommend trying to do first, just because you've already laid groundwork. And uh, as a GM, it, it's always good to end up using any kind of preparation that you do in some way, shape or form at some point. So, you know, if you have a player character that part of their backstory, they have a family mess member that disappeared and un maybe under mysterious circumstances and it's unsure what happened to them. Think if there's a way that you can use that in the story that you're already telling. Chances are good that, that you'll figure something out and now, not only is that helping you because maybe it gives you a way to to make something happen that you weren't sure how you were going to do to begin with, but it's also good because it will tend to interest that player at the very least. When that player sees this element of their backstory come up in the actual story that everybody is playing through, that player is going to tend to be more interested in what's going on now because it's very relevant to their character and you're using ideas that they came up with. And so tends to be the case that you will get more buy-in at least from that one player. And as I often say on the show, enthusiasm is contagious. So if you have one player at the table who's like really into what's going on because it's pulling in some mysteries from their backstory that they're curious how you're going to solve or, or deal with, then their enthusiasm will, will tend to carry over to the other players as well. So basically anything in a player character's backstory that is a mystery or that could be a mystery can be a great hook that you can use at some point in the campaign. And also you don't have to use it right away. So if you're planning a longer running campaign, like maybe you're going to play for months or even years, you know, this is something you could sit on for a while and bring up later. I mean, if you have a way to use it right away, that's awesome. But if not, just, you know, keep it in your notes, keep it in the back of your mind and look for an opportunity to use that. And in some ways, it's even more fun when it happens later in the campaign, because it'll get to the point where if the player was thinking maybe you would use that mystery, because some players are pretty savvy and they will create things like this in their backstory explicitly so that you can use it in the hopes that the GM will take that and do something with it. So if that's the case, um, sometimes if, if it's, you know, further in the campaign, the player will start to just assume that, oh, I, I guess the GM's not going to use that. And so when all of a sudden it, it comes up, if it's been a while, that can sometimes add to the excitement factor just because the, the player had kind of given up on that cu coming up or maybe hadn't even forgotten about it. And then it comes up and it's like, oh, wow, cool. Th this is awesome. So that's pretty cool. Another possibility is sometimes a player will include some tragedy or negative incident that happened to their family in their past as part of the backstory. And this might be something you can use too. So in my recent D&D campaign, one of the players was a member of a merchant family and her father had died. The player character's father had died. Uh, it's a little confusing because it was a male player, but a female character. So um, got to keep my pronouns straight here. So uh, the PC's father had died, which forced her mother to take over the business, which beforehand the, the father had mainly run. And then the business had struggled for a bit under the player character's mother's leadership because uh, she was she was new to running the business and she had to kind of learn what she was doing. 
But then uh, the business recovered. And now in the, the present day of, of the adventure, the business is quite prosperous again. So it turns out, and, and this was all part of the character's backstory, that the mother had actually made an, a deal with the Narinis, which is a type of devil that had led to this prosperity of the business. So when the business was failing, when it wasn't doing well, uh, the mother had literally made a deal with the devil, uh, which led to things turning around and, and the business doing really well. Also, this Arinis, this devil that the mother made the deal with, is the player character's father because the player character is a tiefling. So this all actually came up in the campaign when the player characters went to Avernus, which is the first layer of the Nine Hells, and this player character, the Rinny's father, showed up. And, you know, it's like, oh, hey, you were in my neighborhood, so I thought I'd come introduce myself because the player character had never met her father before. And he showed up to get acquainted with his daughter and also tried to buy her soul, but, but to meet this daughter that, that he'd never met. So that that was really cool. And that was a whole scene that that would never have happened without that in the player character's backstory. The whole reason that that happened was because I knew the player character was a tiefling. I knew as part of the backstory, the player character had this Irini's father, a, a devil that she'd never met. They were in the nine hells. So I felt like it would be a major failure on my part as a DM if, if this didn't come up in some way while they were in the nine hells. So uh, I had the father show up. Um, he heard through the grapevine that, that these adventurers were there, realized one of them was his daughter and decided to go introduce himself. So another thing you can look for if you're uh, looking for things in a player character's backstory to use in your campaign is look for anything in the backstory that it seems like the player and or the character seems to be really invested in or really interested in or passionate about. So for example, maybe the character has a twin sibling that isn't an adventurer or the backstory mentions a childhood best friend or lover. If there's a character in the backstory that the player and or the player character really seems to care about, then this is the perfect NPC to involve in the story that you want to tell. Because again, you're going to have more buy-in from that one player because you're using this NPC that they created that they that they really like or that their character really likes for some reason. So ideally, uh, you would place this NPC in danger in some way so that they need to be protected or rescued by the player character and the rest of the party. So with any of these ideas that I'm kind of throwing out here for this, you can create something entirely new for the campaign using that idea as a starting point. Or again, maybe you already have something planned and you realize that something in a player character's backstory is just a thing and will be a great way to maybe hook the player characters into the adventure that you want to tell or maybe meet an NPC that you want them to meet or get some information they need to get or something like that. So you could have enemy soldiers pass through the player character's home village on the way to their next battle. They stop at the village to resupply. Maybe the PC's twin sister, who is an adventurer, falls in love with one of the soldiers and decides to tag along when the army leaves town. The PC might want to, quote, rescue the sister as she's now in a very dangerous situation traveling with an invading army. Or maybe the PC's past lover offends one of the soldiers in some way and is taken with the army by force as a laborer for their camp. I think the key here is to look for possible interesting conflicts and then follow those conflicts where they take you, looking for ways to involve things or people from the backstory that the player seems to care about or seems invested in. So, you know, as far as how to know what they care about, that's kind of a thing of just intuition, I guess, or, or just knowing your players. But you can kind of get an idea by how much time they spend on it, you know, or how many words they devote to it. You know, if they spend a lot of time talking about this twin sister that, that they have or whatever, then 
it's probably a good chance that, that that's something that they care about, if only because they put a bunch of time into figuring it out and developing it. So that's what I tend to go by is, you know, how big of a part of a backstory is this? If, if the player gives me a one page backstory and half of that page is about this twin sister, then to me, that's a pretty clear indicator that, that that's something important to the player and, and something I should try to use in some way. Another approach to all this is to think about how the setting or, or specifically the NPCs in the setting will react to what the player characters do. So this is referencing Kaigar's example of the player character who creates a thieves guild. So if your players, for instance, create a thieves guild, assuming it's a decent sized city that already has one or more thieves guild operating within it, how do these other guilds feel about this new competing thieves guild? And how do they react to that? You know, as a general rule, guilds are usually not super cool with new competition. They, they tend to try to eliminate that. So I could see a lot of danger and conflict here from the established thieves guild or guilds and, and this new guild. Another way to think about it is, is how do the authorities in the place react when they find out? So the authorities of, of the city or the town or the village. Um, what about other adventurers in the area? How do they react to what the player characters are doing? Etc. So you can often get a lot of mileage just by thinking about how NPCs that you've already established and created and, and kind of know how they will react to what the player characters do and, and the consequences of what the player characters do. So these NPCs could be uh, villains that you've created for the campaign, as well as authority figure NPCs in the area. Um, so the leaders of the city or whatever. Um, especially if the player characters are doing like pretty big things that, that have an impact on, on the city as a whole, um, the authorities are going to have opinions about that and they may act on those opinions. I also tend to look for glaring holes in the PC's plans that can be exploited by NPCs. And in my experience, at least these almost always exist. If you look for them, um, usually any plan or scheme the players come up with, if you really start picking it apart, there, there will be some huge blind spots or, or huge holes in there that, that can be taken advantage of. And if you have some smart NPCs uh, that are opposed to the player's characters, then they probably will take advantage of those, those holes. And, you know, one approach to this is to look at the assumptions that the players are making. And players usually make a lot of assumptions when they're making plans or, or whatever they're doing. They'll make a lot of assumptions about the world about NPCs, things like that. And I examine all those assumptions the players are making and I ask myself, are these assumptions true? And sometimes, a lot of times they are because, you know, hopefully you've created a, a logical environment so the players can make logical assumptions and, and they tend to be true. But sometimes they're not. Sometimes the players don't have enough information and they're filling in a lot of gaps with assumptions and theories and sometimes the players fall in love with these assumptions and theories and will forget that they're, they're not fact. They'll treat them as if they are a fact. And those can be great moments to surprise the characters when, when, and the players when some assumption they've been making for so long that they just now assume is fact turns out to be wrong and in some way bites them in the ass. Uh, those can be really fun moments. So I think just in the interest of fun and keeping things interesting and keeping the players on their toes, that not all the assumptions the players make should be true. There should be at least some that are at least a little off, even if all the, the assumptions are logical. Because, you know, for, for instance, if you're talking about NPCs and what NPCs motives might be or what they might do, people don't always make decisions based on logic. And in fact, um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that people seldom make decisions based on logic. Uh, decisions tend to be made based on emotions. And then logic is later used to justify uh, that decision. Um, so NPCs are going to be the same way. And uh, so sometimes um, the, the players will misread them or, or make a wrong assumption about w what this NPC is going to do or why the NPC is doing what they're doing. 
So Kaigor went, went on to, because we discussed this a little bit in the Discord, went on to give me some more information. Uh, he told me that the Thieves Guild that the players created was the only Thieves Guild in the city. So my ideas of, of you know, opposing guilds and, and how they would react won't, won't really work for, for that situation. Um, and also the player character doesn't run the guild. The player just created it. The, the player just said, hey, my rogue wants to join a guild. And Kaigor hadn't come up with a guild yet. So, so he let the player uh, create it as much of that as he wanted, which is awesome. That's a, that's a great way to do it and a great way to kind of spread the workload a bit when it comes to the wor- world building. And that too will bring player involvement and investment more if, if they get to be involved with creating that stuff. If you have players that want to do that. But even with there not being another Thieves Guild, there probably are other guilds of other types that the Thieves Guild might affect. So different merchant guilds and whatnot might might be impacted. Their businesses might be impacted by the Thieves Guild. So you could still use some of those ideas, still still have some consequences. But again, if, if the player character isn't running the guild or isn't higher up in the guild, you know, that that may not be the best approach um, if they're just kind of a foot soldier in this guild. But they could still become involved in these kind of bigger conflicts between the leaders of their guild and these other guilds or the authorities in the city or or whatever. So just because the player character isn't a leader in the guild, even as just, you know, one of the lower ranking members, uh, they still might have to deal with the consequences of, of these conflicts in the city. Um, so Kaigar says, you know, that he got the this Thieves Guild from from this one player but that the other players, he has to do more, more prodding to even figure out what they want. And, and I definitely know how that is. I, I've definitely had players like that. You know, you, you will have some players that are very clear about what they want. They either will come out and tell you what they want. If, if you ask, or even if you don't, you know, what kind of adventure they want or, or whatever, or they may indirectly tell you by the way they build their character or what they put in their backstory things like that. Like, like if a player has a bunch of political stuff in their backstory, I feel like that player is probably telling you that they like political intrigue and are hoping to see that kind of thing. If you have a war or an invasion or something like that happening in your world and your, your player has a lot of stuff about that in their backstory, um, like the war has affected their family or themselves a lot that's probably telling you that that player is interested in this conflict and, and wants to be involved in it as part of the campaign. So a lot of times you can glean quite a bit from, from the backstory they give you or the backgrounds they choose for their characters or, or just whatever they do to flesh out the character will oftentimes give you some ideas of, of what that player likes or, or kind of what they're looking for or hoping for. So going back to, to Kaigar's for, I think I say it different every time, uh, kind of question here and, and thinking about these, the Thieves Guild that the player created and, and what do we do with this thing? Well, if the player created the Thieves Guild, even if, you know, he's not a leader in the guild, he's still probably pretty invested in it because he came up with it. It's his idea. So you could try introducing some kind of threat to the guild uh, that the players can deal with in some way. And hopefully if you did that, at least this one player would would be pretty into that. So the thief player, at least, you know, would, would be on board with something like that. And as I said, enthusiasm is often contagious. So so this one, one player might kind of bring the other players along for the ride and get them into it. it. It'd be cool if the thief player character could be instrumental in helping the guild deal with this threat in some way. Uh, with the help of the other player characters, of course. And then th- this player character could get some reward or prestige or, or um, higher position within the guild. Be- because that's something I would probably do. If if I had a player character create a Thieves Guild for my city and their character was just, you know, a low ranking member in the guild, I would probably be working f- or looking for believable ways to advance that character through the ranks in the guild and get them in a higher position um, as soon as I can can without you know making it seem too contrived. Just because I think the player would would dig that. It's like, hey, you created this organization. Um, instead of just being a minion, let's have you be 
um, higher ranking in the organization. So you can make some of the calls and, and make some of the big decisions and um, enjoy some of the ins and outs of, of actually running this thing that you've created. If the player's into that, I mean, the player may not be. So that'd be a good thing to discuss with the player and say, hey, you know, you created this Thieves Guild. Do you want to at some point become, you know, one of the leaders in the guild? Because if you do, we can we can make that happen and we can even make it happen sooner than later if we can come up with a good a good way for that to happen that makes sense. And, you know, the player might be all for that or the player might not. Um, so it's it's good to ask. So I talked about this in the last episode when I was talking about the NPCs in the player character's home base. But another great way to get players more invested in the game and the setting is to threaten the things that they care about in the game. So one approach is to look at the ideas the players are giving you, like a guild they've created or whatever, and ask if there are any fun and interesting ways you could threaten that thing in a way that the PCs can get involved. You know, you, you don't want to just destroy something the players cared about just to do it necessarily. But it, but if it's something where they can become involved and, and help to save this thing or prevent it from being destroyed or harmed in some way, then that can be a lot of fun. And again, you, you're probably going to get some some extra buy in, at least from the players that were involved in creating it. So again, you know, a thieves guild could face some kind of opposition from the powers that be in the city. You know, maybe the authorities start trying to crack down on the guild and and try to, you know, bring it to justice, so to speak. So, so maybe they start having more guards in the streets and, and start arresting people for stealing and things like that um, more easily and with less evidence and, and things like that to try to crack down on the crime in the city. Something like that. So yeah, so there are some of my thoughts on what what to do with with these things that the the players create in the world and and how you can kind of use that to enrich the story and the campaign that you're telling. But again, you know, this is all just a tip of, of a huge iceberg. So hopefully some of you listening to this have some other ideas for this kind of thing. And if you do, feel free to shoot me an email at gamemastersjourney at gmail.com or let me know in our Discord server. And uh, yeah, we can we can come back to this later with some more ideas if, if you all give me some more ideas. Because I'm, you know, I just had a couple here. I'm sure there's a lot more creative ways that, that we could use things that the player characters create during play or during their backstory and pull those into our adventures and make them matter in the setting and the story because that's awesome. All right, next up, Eyes of a Bard on our Discord asked about reflecting different cultures in your world. So Eyes of a Bard says, how would one inject some semblance of different cultures in different regions of your world? So here are some of my thoughts and ideas on this, and let's see where this takes us. So first, I think a great way to approach this is to model a given culture in your world after a culture from human history, or even better, use a combination of two or more cultures from human history. So we see this approach used a lot in things like Star Trek, The Lord of the Rings, The Wheel of Time, The Witcher, etc., etc. A lot of these stories and other stories will take cultures from Earth history, maybe as is, maybe give them a spin, maybe combine them with elements from a few other cultures and use that as a, as a launching point for a culture in this fictitious world. However, the inspiration of the real world culture should be the beginning of your creative process. They should be the beginning of this journey, not the end. So for instance, you don't want to just base a culture completely on a real culture. So you don't want to just completely base some culture on your world on feudal Japan from a specific time period and or region. First off, that's pretty unoriginal, right? Like you want to, you don't want to just copy (laughs) something that really happened and and just call it a day. You want to put your own spin on it, make it yours, make it new and interesting and unique. So yeah, you wouldn't want to just take feudal Japan and say, this culture is feudal, feudal Japan. But Maybe what you could do if if you really like feudal Japan and you want to use some aspects of that is take the things 
from that culture that, that you think are cool and that you want to play with. And then take some things from one or two other cultures that you think are cool and you'd like to play with and mash them together. So maybe you might take some elements from feudal Japan, take some other elements from the Roman Empire, and then take some other elements from the Aztec Empire and put those together into something new and different. And this thing that you've now created, this new culture, is, yeah, it's going to have some touchstones. It's going to have things about it that are going to remind players of these influences. Like, um, oh, wow, this reminds me of feudal Japan. Or, oh, this reminds me of the Roman Empire. Or, oh, this reminds me of the Aztecs, right? But the entire culture won't be that way. Because, again, you're, you're taking elements from a few different sources and mixing them together. So the end result is going to be different hopefully, than either one of those three cultures. I, I should think it would be. I I, cho- I chose just off the top of my head, I chose three cultures I know a little bit about that definitely have some similarities, but also have a lot of differences. And that's just one approach you could take. But just as an example, you know, I think you could take those three cultures and take elements that you really like from each of them, maybe fill in the gaps with stuff you make up that's not from either of those, that'd be pretty cool. And, and end up with something where, again, you know, the players may recognize some of the influences, but they're not going to be like, oh, this is just the Roman Empire because it won't be, it'll be different. So another thing you can do, my second idea here is uh, use the concept of the strange attractor that we talked about last time. So the idea here is to combine something, quote, normal with something, quote, strange or even two strange things that basically taking two things or two ideas that at first glance don't seem to fit together at all and figuring out a way to make them fit together that's really cool and unique. So yeah, you want to combine two things that don't seem immediately compatible. A great way to approach this is to just start brainstorming ideas and just make a list. And if you're not familiar with brainstorming, when you're brainstorming, you're just generating ideas in in the the trick or the key to brainstorming is you you are not judging or evaluating the ideas. So I love a whiteboard for this, um, but a piece of paper works great too. So maybe you're wanting to make a culture, right? And, and you're going to do what I'm talking about. You're like, you know what? I want to take two or more different cultures and kind of take bits from each and mash them together to create something new. So to start with, with your brainstorming, You might just make a list of cultures that you find interesting that you might use for this, or maybe more specifically, you might make a list of elements of cultures that you really like. So maybe you might write down samurai, ninjas, feudalism, armor made out of feathers, (laughs) something from the Aztecs there, Um, and and so on and so on. But the, the, the key to brainstorming here is when you're making this list, any idea you have goes on the list. There's no, oh, I'm not writing that down. That's dumb, right? It doesn't care. At this point, try not to even think about, is it a good idea? Is it dumb? Do I like it? Do I hate it? Just if you have an idea that pops in your head, write it down on the list. The, the, the goal really with brainstorming is to make, to have as many things on that list as you can. We're not worried about how good the ideas are or how bad. We just want as many ideas as we can. Because the next step, what we're going to do once we have that list is then we're going to go through and pick out the best ideas. So it's not like if there's a bad idea, it's, you know, it's going to stay there for very long. But sometimes when you're brainstorming something that at first might seem like a terrible idea, you think about it more and it's actually not that terrible of an idea. Or you find another idea to, to combine this terrible idea with, and suddenly you have something awesome. So that's why in brainstorming, you don't want to reject anything. You want to write everything down. So yeah, I, w- I would write down as many cultural elements I could think of that I think might be cool. And then once I had that, I would I would go through that list and, and start selecting the ones I want to use. And this is where you can look for your strange attractors and maybe pick some things intentionally that don't seem to go together. And you're like, man, I don't know how I'm going to make these two ideas work together, but that's part of the fun. And then finding a way to make them work together, you probably end up creating something different that people haven't seen before. And that that'll be cool. So yeah, brainstorm a list as big of a list as you can make. Once you've got your list, go through, find the best ideas or the coolest ideas or the ideas you're most excited with. And then think about 
taking a few of those and, and using those and mashing them together. And if you can find a couple that you really dig and you're excited about, but they really seem not to go together super well or, or it seems really strange to try to put them together, uh, try to do that. See where it takes you. So that's the whole strange attractor concept. All right. Uh, third idea. Another approach would be to take a culture you're familiar with or perhaps a hodgepodge culture you've created as, as we've discussed in this episode so far, and then change one or two or more major things about that culture and then ask questions about how that would change things and see where that takes you. So, so you take this culture you've either created or that you like and you ask yourself, what if I change this one thing about it to this other thing? What would that do? What would be the consequences of that? Where does that take me? Is that cool? Is that something I'm interested in? So we see this kind of thing a lot in sci-fi and sometimes in, in fantasy too. A lot of sci-fi stories, are, especially like short stories, are these kind of what-if stories. Like, what if in the future this happened, right? Um, <laughs> there's been so many uh, short stories and things on like Dark Mirror and, and stuff like that. that that's, uh, a big trend lately is the whole like social media thing and thumbs upping and down stuff. So I, I've seen so many things in recent years about, oh, in the future, you know, people's personalities are are liked or disliked on social media and that that um, influences your standing in society and things like that. So that's, that's a what if kind of thing is like, what if we took this concept from social media of liking or disliking a post or whatever. And what if we applied that to people and the things that people say and the things that people do? And what if everybody is constantly evaluating everyone around them and thumbsing up and thumbsing down what they say and do? And some AI aggregates all this and gives everybody a score that tells how good of a person they are. And that's what determines your lifestyle and what kind of luxuries you get and what kind of education you get, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, I mean, there's been so many of those in recent years, but that's just a simple, you know, what if this one thing about our society changed, what would the world look like then? And, and you can see there's been lots of very different stories told about just that one idea. So another example of this might be, uh, what would it look like if I took current American culture and said that there's a new technology developed where you can put a chip inside your brain that gives you constant wireless access to the internet, smart devices, things like that. Um, so th this kind of thing is already being developed. Um, e Elon Musk's uh, thing, I'm blanking on what, what he calls it right now. Uh, this kind of thing, this idea of, of being able to have an interface between the brain and technology uh, right now it's being developed a lot for, um, replacement limbs for, for amputees. Uh, so you can have a, a bionic arm that you actually move just like you would move your normal arm by just, you know, thinking with your brain that you want your arm to move. Um, you know, we're developing this technology as, as I'm speaking. Uh, so this isn't that crazy of an idea actually. But yeah, what, what if everybody had this chip in their head that you're constantly connected to the internet and you're able to connect with any kind of smart device through that? You don't have to use your phone or whatever. It, it's inside your head. Now, let's say we have this. This is part of society now. Now let's fast forward 10 years. What does the world look like now? What does American culture look like now after 10 years with this technology and everybody's got it? How does this change day-to-day -day life? How are things different? How are things the same? Maybe, maybe some things would be completely unaffected by this. So yeah, you can, you can have a lot of fun just doing something like that. And, and again, a lot of stories in sci-fi do, do exactly this. Another approach you can take or another thing you can try is subverting expectations, which is simply where the player or the reader or whatever is expecting one thing to happen and something else happens instead. So maybe you're going for a more traditional Tolkien-esque kind of world, but you want to be a little more creative than that. You don't want to just clone Middle Earth. So you could subvert some expectations in some interesting and surprising ways. Because if you present your world as very similar to Middle Earth, and maybe you even say this is very similar to Middle Earth, 
then immediately any players that are at all familiar with Middle Earth are going to make a bunch of assumptions about your setting just because they're thinking, oh, everything's going to be the same as Middle Earth. But surprise, not everything's the same. And those things that are different can be surprising and interesting. So just some ideas uh, here off the top of my head. Uh, so maybe in your tolkien S setting, uh, the dwarves have developed some kind of technology that normally wouldn't exist in this kind of setting. Uh, maybe there are halflings in the setting that are fierce and brave warriors, kind of the opposite of, of the hobbits, right? Uh, maybe the orcs in the world are super smart and civilized. Maybe they're as civilized as the elves or more, etc. So, So all those are taking a trope from Tolkien, are taking an assumption that people would make if you told them this world is very similar to Middle Earth and it's doing something different with that. So it's not what they expect. So, you know, you read the Lord of the Rings and you're thinking this, this is a world like that. You're, you're not going to expect civilized and intelligent orcs you know, in their smoking jackets with their pipes, uh, discussing your world's equivalent of Shakespeare or whatever. So yeah, that can be a lot of fun. So think about the assumptions people would make about the world based on expectations. For instance, it's going to be like Middle Earth or it's going to be like the Forgotten Realms or it's going to be like the world of Dune or whatever it is. And then ask yourself, what are some interesting and fun ways I could do something different from what they're going to expect? And then do that. So I think Eberron, actually, the, the D&D setting of Eberron does this with how it handles magic in the world. So, you know, for the most part, D&D worlds are based on Tolkien, at least to some degree. And part of that is the assumption in most D&D worlds, and that's what we tend to assume if we're not told otherwise, that, that magic is fairly rare and exotic, which is to say, if, if you're talking about some peasant in some remote village, they may have never seen magic before, right? And in a lot of D&D games and a lot of D&D settings are like this, but in Eberron, Magic is pretty commonplace in every day, at least lower level forms of magic. And it's used and approached much more like we use and approach technology today than magic is approached in Tolkien, where it's this kind of mysterious, unknowable thing. And really only the wizards understand it. And we, I don't think we even know how much the wizards really understand it. But we certainly, you know, none of the characters know what Gandalf can and can't do. Right. None of the readers know what Gandalf can and can't do. Um, it, it's undefined, or if it is defined, it's not knowledge that anyone other than a wizard has. Um, it's not knowledge that the reader has. So that's a very different approach than, you know, the streetlights run on magic and common everyday people have access to minor magic items and things like that, like like we see in Eberron. So so Eberron is taking this assumption and going a different direction with it. And, and the assumption would not be true in Eberron. Um, and Eberron does that with a lot of things. The magic is just one small example of the many ways that Eberron is different from, from a Tolkien type world. So I think a great way to do this in D&D, if we're talking about D&D specifically, is with alignments. So to me, it's much more interesting and realistic as well. And, and which is to say to go against the assumptions people will make based on and dealing with alignment. So maybe there's a nation of orcs in your world that's highly civilized, like we talked about before. Maybe the orcs in this nation, at least if not all the orcs in your world, tend towards lawful good instead of chaotic evil or whatever orcs are said to be. Maybe some of the most feared, dangerous, and destructive dragons in your world are actually metallic dragons which in most worlds are the, quote, good dragons. Maybe these dragons have gone insane, or maybe they're just plain evil. Or maybe they see themselves as so superior to humans and other humanoids that morality doesn't really apply. Human morality doesn't apply to dragons. Kind of like how a lot of people in the world today will do things or know things are done to animals that they would never do or tolerate being done to people but they're totally okay with it being done to animals because, you know, our morality doesn't apply to animals because animals are less than us. I'm not saying I believe this. I'm saying this is what some people believe. I'm making a, a parallel here, right? So you could have a dragon that looks at humans just like a lot of humans look at a cow. 
It doesn't have rights. We don't care if it suffers. We don't care if we kill it on a whim. It doesn't matter. You know, if someone kills a cow, they don't go on trial for murder, right? So, or at least not here in America. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you could have the same kind of thing. Have, have a little more nuance, you know? I mean, come on. <laughs> so another way to, uh, another great way to subvert expectations in DAD is other than going against the alignment assumptions is to go against the monolithic cultures that present. And, we, and we've already been kind of touching on this with the, the orcs and even the dragons, which is to say all dwarves are the same or all mountain dwarves are the same. Uh, all wood elves are the same, etc. cetera. Notice they don't do this with humans. You know, humans, they got all these different cultures, but every other race is like, nope, they're all the same. <laughs> so maybe you have dwarves that dwell in the forest or maybe you have elves that shun the use of magic, something like that. So, so think about these assumptions and find ways to go against them. And you might find something interesting and cool that you really like. Now, I think a lot of the limitations and problems presented in D&D specifically are due to laziness in the writing, lack of creativity, and honestly, just plain narrow-mindedness and lack of education or knowing any better. But just because these flaws exist in the game as presented by wizards, and previous publishers doesn't mean they have to exist in your game. You can make the game whatever you want, and I encourage you to do so. Another thing you can do to really get outside of the box with your world is go beyond American and European cultures. You may think there's a lot of diversity among American and European cultures, and there is, but it's really, again, just the tip of a very large iceberg when it comes to human diversity overall and not just right now, but throughout history. So if you really want to take your world building to the next level, look to cultures that are very different from our own. Native American cultures, African cultures, Asian cultures, etc., etc., etc. Start mixing and matching elements of these, and you'll end up with something very different. So for example, my city of Alondria, the, the culture of that city in my world of Primordia, is loosely based on some native North American and South American cultures that I studied and learned about in school. So I did exactly what I'm talking about here. I took a few different cultures and took some elements from each that I liked and, and put them together in my own thing. I, I did the same thing with uh, Dinar's Rest. Even, even down to the buildings, um, what they look like and how they're built uh, came from specific cultures that I've studied. So again, talking about Alondria, one element of that city and culture that all by itself makes the setting very different is that it is matrilineal in nature, which is to say that descent, who you're related to, is based on who your mother is, not who your father is. So most, most of us listening to this, we live in patrilineal cultures, which is, which is to say that who you're related to is traced through your father. So for instance, here in the United States, traditionally when a man and woman get married, the woman takes the man's last name and then the children will have the father's last name um, because we trace descent through the father. As soon as you start to think about it for more than a few minutes, or it might not take that long, matrilineal actually makes a lot more sense. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I think I've talked about that on the show before, so we, we won't get on that uh, soapbox today. Now, there there is a a possible issue here. And, and I have seen this in my games is, you know, this thing, matrilineal cultures. I mean, most people don't even know what that is. And that's fine. If you don't, I'd, I'd say in general, only anthropologists know what that is. I certainly had never even heard the term uh, before I started going to school for anthropology. So th there is no shame in not knowing what that is. Most people don't. So that can be a problem you know, when none of your players understand what this thing is. Um, so it's going to, you know, increase the learning curve a bit. So, you know, again, unless you've studied anthropology or maybe listened to this podcast before, you may not even know what a matrilineal culture means other than what I just told you. So it is a double-edged sword in that way. Um, if you do use something like this, it's way outside your player's experience that they have no reference for. Um, like a matrilineal culture, then you're going to have to do a lot more explaining and you're going to have to explain things numerous times before it really sinks in 
And it, it may never sink in depending how much it, it comes up in the game. But but do be, be prepared. There, there may be and probably will be quite a bit of confusion among the players as, as they kind of wrap their their heads around this very alien idea. So so that is a that is a downside, you know, but I'm a, I'm a strong believer in the, you know, nothing ventured, nothing, nothing gained kind of thing. You know, nothing worthwhile was ever accomplished without some effort. So personally, I mean, it is a possible downside, I guess, in that way that, oh, well, it's going to take some more work for people to understand it. But I don't really see that as a negative personally, because those things tend to be more rewarding, right? If you have to work a little harder to understand that something, then when you finally understand that thing, you get more of a feeling of accomplishment than you did something that's just instantly you just grasp it, right? So yeah, honestly, I think the best advice I can give to anyone about this is to read some ethnographies. So ethnographies are studies of other cultures that are written by anthropologists. So usually or traditionally, an ethnography is an anthropologist will go uh, to study one specific culture. They will go live among them. And anthropology is called participant observation, where you go live with the people, you participate in as much of their day-to-day life as you can, while at the same time trying to remain kind of an outside observer that is not affecting what's going on. So you want to participate so that you can understand it better. But ideally, you want to see how these people live and operate when you're not there. Like you don't want to color the data with with your influence, right? Um, Of course, this is difficult slash impossible to do, but we try, right? So what happens is, is the anthropologist will go, they will live with the people for weeks, months, even years sometimes, Um, participate in day-to-day life and, you know, weddings, funerals, hunts, stuff like that, harvest festivals, all all of it, eat the food, all that kind of stuff. And then the ethnography is then a book that they write about that culture and about what they learned. But the reason these are great to read for anyone, not just anthropologists, is is first you're going to learn about a new culture. Usually, These are cultures that either have not been studied before or haven't been studied in depth. And usually or often they're they're very different from our culture here in the United States. But the other nice thing about them is they they are oftentimes written as a story because it's kind of the first hand account of this anthropologist going to live with these people and what their experiences were. And they're often really entertaining even if you were just to read this as just a story to read just for entertainment, if you weren't trying to learn anything or get something for your world building, uh, these stories are often very just entertaining and interesting to read because it's the story of someone like us going into a very different place and learning basically to fit in. And there are often hilarious things that happen you know, as, as this person bumbles around trying to fit in with these people. And uh, yeah, it, it's usually quite entertaining. And and then there's the satisfaction as the anthropologist starts to connect the dots and starts to understand what's going on and and starts to fit in and starts to become or, or to be seen as part of the tribe, so to speak. Um, so, so they're great fun and you can learn a lot from them. Now, some of them are fairly dry, you know, and scholarly, but, but like I said, a lot of them read like stories and, and some of them are really well written. So one example of this, I'll, I'll name right away just because it's always been my favorite for, for whatever reason is, uh, the forest people by Colin Turnbull. It's a great read and it can give you some great ideas for any kind of sylvan based or forest dwelling culture. So like your wood elves, you know, things like that. One thing that's really stayed with me from this book is how the people in the the culture handled conflict in their society. So their, their villages were fairly small. So don't know how this would work on a large scale, if at all. But basically, they used social shaming and ostracism. And with such a small, isolated group, it was highly affected. So, you know, if you, quote, broke the rules, you know, they didn't execute you or put you in prison or cut off your hand or anything like that. 
just nobody would talk to you until you convinced everyone in the village that you'd learned your lesson and you were sorry. And until then, like literally no one would talk to you. And you may think, oh, so what? <laughs> but um, humans are social creatures. And, and even for one of us in our society today, imagine if you could, if no one would talk to you and, and no one would talk to you in any way, they, they wouldn't talk to you online or by email or on Twitter and just no one would interact with you at all. And then live like that for a few days or weeks or whatever. And imagine how you might feel now probably might be hard or even impossible to imagine that because we're so connected. But if you can now imagine that you live in a very small community where maybe, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred people or something. And that's all the people, you know, period. And none of those people will talk to you. Imagine how, how lonely you would get, how quickly and, and how eventually you would get to the point where you would do or say just about anything just to get people to talk to you again. So yeah, super effective. I, I sometimes wonder if maybe we're seeing uh, a modern analog of this starting to happen with social media, the way, um, for instance, like with the Me Too movement right now, how, you know, these people do these things that, that men specifically, not that it's all men, but it's a lot of men, um, have been doing for a long time and would just get away with and, and was just considered normal. But now with, you know, things like Twitter and, and whatnot, I'm not going to name the other one, but <laughs> not that there's only two, but, but now that we have these social networks where, you know, millions of people could communicate, uh, these stories tend to get circulated more. And, you know, these people have to deal with a lot of fallout beyond even their local community as everyone in the world finds out what they did. Uh, another great example of this kind of thing right now is, you know, these idiots that will refuse to wear masks and will like go into a Walmart or whatever and pitch a fit when they're told that they can't shop without their mask on and, and make a big ass of themselves. And then someone videotapes that with their phone and puts it up on Twitter and whatnot. And now everybody in the country and even in the world is watching you be a jackass. You know, that that's a whole level of consequence to doing something like that that didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago. So yeah, sometimes I wonder if maybe we're, we're going to get this, this social shaming back, which I think honestly would be a great thing. Um, I think that's one of the problems in the world today is lack of accountability. And it's too easy to just disappear into the masses and, you know, just be a horrible person online and stuff and, and never have to uh, see the consequences of your actions. But who knows? Time will tell. But it's, it's interesting to see and, and observe <laughs> what's happening. So in addition to the forest people, I found some more uh, ethnographies that you might like. And I have not actually read all of these. I, I think I will. But I found some websites where people were compiling lists of ethnographies that, that are approachable by the lay person, which is to say someone who doesn't have a degree in anthropology or isn't going to school for anthropology, something that just anybody can pick up and read and, and enjoy and maybe learn something from. So some of these I haven't read and, and I'll just tell you a little bit about them uh, based on um, what these people said that, that have read them. Um, if you go to the show notes at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey for this episode 285, I will have links to these books so you can check them out and read them if, if you would like. But yeah, you know, if you are someone who is really serious about your world building and you want to go outside the box, you don't want to just recreate Middle Earth or Forgotten Realms or whatever, and, and you want to do something really unique and create something that your players haven't seen before, and you're really serious about it. And if you're also interested in just humanity and you'd like to learn a little bit more about the human experience and, and what life is like for people that are that are very different from us, then I, I think you're going to get a lot out of these books and I think you'll really enjoy reading them. And I'm honestly, I'm anticipating hearing from some of you, hopefully telling me how much you enjoyed one of these books and how You've never read anything like that before. You didn't even know things like that had existed. Um, Cause that's definitely how I felt when, when I read the forest people, which maybe that's the one, why that's the one that really sticks with me. Cause it's the first ethnography I've read. 
Some of these on this list I actually had read and had forgotten about until I read someone talking about it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that book. But The Forest People I've always remembered, maybe because it was the first one I read. But I did really enjoy it. All right. Let's see. What do we've got? Okay. First one is a classic. Um, another cool thing is, is I'm not sure how many on this list, but quite a few of these uh, ethnographies are written by women. And the reason is, is there are a lot of women and have been a lot of women anthropologists ever since the beginning of anthropology. In fact, among the sciences, it's one of the ones, if not the one that has the, the most uh, female uh, scientists that there, there are a lot of w famous women anthropologists, um, which is awesome. So hopefully we'll see more of that in the other sciences as uh, the world hopefully continues to turn. Um, so yeah, so I first uh, recommended The Forest People by Colin Turnbull. Uh, next, classic. Uh, <laughs> I, I read this book, pretty much probably anybody who has a degree in anthropology or took an intro to anthropology class in college probably read this book. I, I've, it's probably required reading in, in most anthropology programs. And that is Coming of Age in Samoa by Margaret Mead. In fact, you may have even heard of this book and know nothing about anthropology. It, it's a pretty famous book. Um, Margaret Mead was one of the, the big anthropologists in the beginning, one of the really famous ones. Um, so this is Ruminations on the Variety of Sexual Moors in Different Cultures and their effect on how children are raised and how they turn out fascinating stuff. This stuff will blow your mind. Tell you what, you want to get out of your box. That, that's a good start. Coming of Age in Samoa by Margaret Mead. Uh, next, we have Tiwi Wives by Jane Goodale. Um, not Jane Goodall. <laughs> this is a different, uh, uh, this is not the uh, primatologist, I, I believe is what she was called, that studied the, the apes. What was it? Um, gorillas, I think she studied. Um, but anyway, Tiwi Wives by Jane Goodale. A reviewer describes it as an eye-opening study of the role of women in an Australian Aboriginal tribe. Um, this person says that the most memorable thing about the Tiwi to them was that the elder women got to pick from among the newly marriageable men, uh, the young men, as husbands, while the elder men got to pick barely pubescent teen girls as wives. This meant that both boys and girls first learned about sex and housekeeping from a spouse much older than themselves, but the elder spouse would soon die. And as the young man or woman got older and higher in the tribal hierarchy, they themselves would wind up with progressively younger spouses until their roles were reversed. Fascinating. Fascinating. I think that right there is probably a good clue to you to how different some human cultures can be. That's fascinating stuff. This is one I have not read, but I want to read it. This, this is the kind of stuff that really interests me. Uh, next, we have Guests of the Sheik by Elizabeth Warnock Fernea. I hope I'm saying that right. Who's actually a non-anthropologist who accompanied her anthropologist husband, Richard Fernea, during his field research among a tribe of Shiite Muslim Marsh Arabs in southern Iraq in the 1950s. As fate would have it, Elizabeth's book about her experiences turned into somewhat of a bestseller and was a much more insightful read about the lives of women in particular in such a tightly knit, gender-segregated society than her husband's book was. So that's pretty cool. She wasn't even an anthropologist. Um, but, you know, hopefully without offending anyone, and deep down I think we're all anthropologists to some degree. Maybe not professionally or or trained, but we all have an interest in, in humanity, I think, because we're all narcissists. Um, another great one, this one I did read, The Fierce People by Napoleon Chagnon about the aggressive and warlock, warlock, oh my God. The Fierce People by Napoleon Chagnon about the aggressive and warlike Yanomamo tribe of Venezuela. Another one is The Chrysanthemum and the Sword by Ruth Benedict, another very famous anthropologist, which is a study of Japanese culture from an anthropological perspective. That sounds really interesting too. I'm, I really dig Japanese culture. I should read that one. I'm pretty sure. I've read some books by Ruth Benedict, but I, I didn't read that one. And finally, Good to Eat by Marvin Harris. I am a huge fan of Marvin Harris 
and I'm a huge fan of cultural materialism, uh, which Marvin Harris, I don't know if he came up with the idea, but he was a big proponent for it and really contributed to that idea a lot. That's really beyond the spo- scope of this episode. But uh, if you're interested in what that is, just Google uh, cultural materialism or, or just go to Wikipedia and look it up because that's where you're going to end up. And uh, I'm sure Wikipedia has a good article about cultural materialism and what that is. It, it's an anthropological theory that I think makes a lot of sense and is superior, is the quote right answer, but it's hard to prove stuff like that. But uh, yeah, and if you're not getting that, look up uh, cultural materialism and Marvin Harris, because because again, Marvin Harris was, if not the one that came up with the term and the idea, he's one of the anthropologists who's who's done the the kind of seminal works on that. I hope that's the right word. That doesn't sound like the right word, um, but he's done the most influential work and and the beginning work on it. I mean, when I was in school, which was a while ago now he was the man when it came to cultural materialism. In fact, I think he wrote a book called cultural materialism that I did read, but yeah, great stuff. Uh, so this book explains the reasoning behind the dietary taboos of various peoples. For instance, the Semitic prohibition against eating pork and offers the explanation that these were more grounded in ecological or economic concerns than symbolic ones. And that's kind of in a nutshell, what cultural materialism is all about. It's the idea that things in our cultures and our societies are created based on uh, the environment that we're in and, and the necessities of life. And that, you know, we come up with the ideology and everything to fit, fit it later, as opposed to things being created from an ideological uh, perspective. Um, and, and it just, it just bears out, you know, when, when you look at things humans create and the way they do things it, you can always find a reason in the environment that they do it that way. They do it that way because they don't get a lot of rain or they do it that way because of the heat or, or the high altitude or whatever. For, for instance, in the Andes in South America, a lot of folks uh, chewed coca leaves and, and they did it because it helped with altitude sickness because they were living at, at high altitude. Um, things like that. All right. So there you go. There's a, there's a few to get you started. That should keep you busy for a while. Again, if you head to starwalkersheroes.com slash Game Master's Journey, go to the show notes for episode 285. I'll have links for all those books for you. And there's a lot more out there too. So enjoying, enjoy exploring. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for episode 285. Hopefully uh, gave you some ideas to help you in your world building. Uh, If you have any questions about world building or any topics you'd like to hear discussed regarding world building, let me know because I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to this topic again. If you'd like to email me, you can do so at gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. You can call my voicemail at 951-GMJLEX1. That's 951-465-5391. And you can join our community on Discord. You can find links for that in the show notes at starwalkerseos.com slash Game Master's Journey. I hope that you have a chance to play an RPG this week. I hope you have a chance to run an RPG. I'll be back soon with another episode of Game Master's Journey. Until then, game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey. Thank you.